Hello everybody, welcome to the Wonky Angle, where I talk about electronic music, both new and old. And today, I'm talking about the second album from M83, Dead Cities, Red Seas, and Lost Ghosts. Okay, it's time to highlight the album that really first put M83 on the map. It may not have been a big commercially successful hit or anything, but it did earn them a lot more critical acclaim and attention from the indie crowd at the time, and still sees lots of glowing reviews to this day. Lots of people were drawn to this album's mix of electronic, noise, and shoegaze, a further amped up and even bigger sounding take on the kinds of sounds they were exploring on their self-titled. Most people I've seen seem to regard this as a significantly improved refinement on what they did before and the point at which they really came into their own and became a band worth paying attention to. Pitchfork gave it a 9.2 out of 10 and went nuts over how it brought a rock edge to an electronic style and recontextualized a genre that they saw as inherently vapid and forgettable and gave it some actual emotion. Typical 2000s pitchfork patronizing, but uh, never mind that. On a personal level, I think I have mentioned my thoughts on this one a few times in the past, but uh, I personally do not agree with the typical critical consensus on this one. This is actually my least favorite M83 album overall. Not to say I don't get why people would get so much into this album, I definitely see the appeal of it and would fully understand if you did think this was their best work. It really just comes down to my personal preference against noise music in general. Dead City's Red Seas and Lost Ghosts is an extremely blown out album. Every single track is trying to sound as huge and monolithic as possible, but gets there with tons of distortion and audio clipping as was sort of the style at the time. For years, I used to think the intent of the album and the way they went about it cancelled each other out. Like, all the clipping was just putting a cap on how expansive they were attempting to sound. To the point where it would even be an example where I would frequently bring up of how clipping audio can hurt an album. Looking back on it now, I do also see how this is the exact element of the album that people were so enamored with. Like, it gave M83 more of a rock edge that allowed them to connect more deeply with that audience, despite, I think, using even less guitars than their debut did. At this point, it's, it's not that I don't see what they were trying to do, or even that I think that they weren't successful, it's just that I think they're self-titled to their stuff better. Not only do I prefer the actual tunes on their debut and find them to be more memorable on average, I think that album did a better job of balancing out the noisier and clipping heavy side of their sound with more subtle and more stripped back moments. It also felt more electronic in its ethos and was better geared towards my own personal taste. This follow-up doubled down on all the elements of their debut that I personally least enjoyed, with much less focus on the parts that really resonated with me. It felt less varied and dimensional as a result as well. Now again, none of this means I think the album is bad, far from it. I do still think it has a pretty solid selection of tunes that are good enough for me to still view the album as pretty decent. It's just less stylistically my thing this time around. Going through individual tracks, after a serviceable enough intro of synth strings and text-to-speech voices that get progressively less distorted in birds, uh, the album opens up and lets you know what you're getting into with Unrecorded. This is one of the moments where I feel like the blown-out production style doesn't get in the way of how expansive they're trying to make it. Lots of gorgeous strings on this one going over all the blaring and buzzing synth arpeggios and gritty guitar pads. The drums are a little on the weak side and are mostly getting swallowed up, but they're just barely able to poke through the mix enough to still give it enough of a sense of groove to remain satisfactory. I do quite like that track. Run Into Flowers explores a similar mix that is markedly flatter sounding, but features a new musical element that M83 hadn't explored before. Actual singing! There's some barely present mumbled singing on this track from Gonzalez himself, a very muted performance that mostly gets swallowed up by all the blaring synths, but he still delivers a solid enough tune. While I wasn't crazy about this cut at first, it was a grower. He's not too bad at this whole singing thing, I wonder if he's gonna focus on that more later down the line. Next we got In Church, which is one of the more popular tracks, but is not really a big favorite of mine. As indicated by the title, this track uh, focuses a lot on overbearing church organs, getting progressively more intense and getting swallowed up by more buzzing synth pads to still keep it thematically in line with everything else here. While I can see how this would be a big emotional highlight for most people, I just don't really care much for this particular sound of church organ on a baseline level. I, it's always just felt really stodgy and stiff and old-fashioned to me. Perhaps that has something to do with my own very mixed experiences with actual church, but uh, I don't know. 
From there, we do get a couple of uh, stronger cuts. America is one of the few tracks here with a solid groove behind it. The drums are faster paced, the electronic effects on top are wilder and more energetic. There's some garbled and audible movie dialogue samples to remind me of some of the sounds from their self-titled. It gets my attention a bit more than many other tracks in the first half of the album. And then On a White Lake Near a Green Mountain is another almost beatless cut uh, as a companion to In Church, but I much prefer this one's focus on, like, expansive sounding synth strings instead of organs. Still go a bit back and forth with this one on whether or not it sounds as expansive or epic as it's trying to be, or if it just comes off a little stodgy and melodramatic again, but it is still nice to have here anyway. Perhaps unfortunately, then we get Noise, my personal least favorite cut in the bunch, and I know that sounds like a cliche coming from me to mark the track called Noise as my least favorite, but it honestly has little to do with the fact that this track is noisy or overbearing, it's really not any more intense than any other track on here. I just think this track happens to be the worst produced out of any cut here, like, the sound is much flatter and less evocative than the track it immediately follows or any cut afterwards either, and the drums are so weak and muffled it's outright distracting, they sound like acoustic drums sound like midi patches with so little power to them, but still attempting to form a groove that they have no hope of carrying. It just does not sound good at all, and the tune isn't really anything to write home about either. I mean, I guess the sound does get thicker and weightier by the end in a slightly more satisfying way, but yeah, still not really a fan of this one. Thankfully, most of the tracks afterwards are actually among my favorites in the bunch. The synth leads on Be Wild are not nearly as distortion-heavy as on most other tracks here. They form a bit more of a, like, a memorable and nostalgic-sounding tune that I quite like. Even when the track gets covered in more screeching noise at the end, I don't think it takes away from the effect. Cyborg has some of the best sounding and most present percussion textures with these punchier 80s style drums and some bleepier synth leads going up next to melancholy guitar lines. And even when the second half of the track breaks into all the clipping and screeching noise yet again, it, it kind of just reminds me of their track Night from their self-titled and I can still get behind it. 0078H is another one of the most attention-grabbing cuts, uh, save for right near the end. A companion to America that has much faster paced percussion textures and more of an energetic feel to its typical intense heaviness. Also featuring all these chopped up female vocals which are a nice touch. And then Gone is a much needed more subtle moment for the album which I've really been itching for at this point. Uh, the first half has a lot of synth string pads which have a subtly dark and dramatic flavor to them, going over some thumping isolated percussion taps, and the second half while predictably ending up in the same noisy territory you'd expect does so in a way that still feels expansive, kinda like other moments here like Unrecorded and On a White Lake Near a Green Mountain. It's not so much of a change of pace to feel out of place next to all these blown out mixes, but it is always pretty refreshing whenever it comes up. It's always at the exact time I record. But that finally takes us to the album's closer, Beauties Can Die, which I am very conflicted on. On one hand, we are finishing with probably the most subtle moment of all, which I'm all for. The clipping walls of sound are less overbearing than usual, there's a lot more focus on these lonely sounding broken electric piano chords. It's a very pretty moment for the album and might have been one of my favorites. Should have been a really refreshing moment if... Not for the bizarre structuring of the piece which, which frustrates me to no end. Once again, we're promised a 14 minute track and that is yet again a tease. There's a hidden track at the end, which is a fine enough pad of guitar, distortion, and synth strings. And it's cool, but yet another victim made pointless by the transition from CD to digital. <laughs> but even the main core of the track itself feels kind of like a tease as well. We're promised a 9 minute track and I just don't think that's accurate. If I want to be generous, the core of the track is only like 7 minutes at best, with those last 2 minutes being so completely inaudible it doesn't even feel like it counts. If I want to be realistic, the core of the track is 4 minutes with a 2 minute fade out and a second hidden track of subtle string pads showing up just barely before the fade out decays completely. And I know the ending of the self-titled sort of did this too, having the core of the final track fading into a long ambient outro that sounds kind of like this track's outro. But I feel like each of the parts of that track are much better connected and feel like they add up more to the same whole than they do here. Back when I first got into these guys, I saw this track as having two hidden tracks separated by two long silences, and felt genuinely ripped off by the supposed 14 minute length be at being inadvertently advertised. I was like, come on, you can't freaking do that. I can't honestly mark it as my least favorite now, since I do think each of the individual parts do help add some much needed toned down subtlety to the album, but boy was I irritated by this back in the day. 
and even now I still think this cut pales in comparison to I'm happy she said. But yeah, that's everything on Dead City's Red Seas and Lost Ghosts. It's not really my thing, but at the same time I feel like everything that I don't really care for on this album could be spun around into positives for the people who do like it. People who love it specifically because it's so blown out and feel like it really adds to the emotionality of the entire thing. I myself don't think this album ever gets so overbearing or tiring as a whole to, to become like an outright chore to listen to. It just has like a few iffy moments sprinkled throughout. And I do feel like they were generally successful in creating a sense of expansive epicness with their sound. I just personally prefer albums that can achieve this effect without so much distortion, that can sound big and epic but have much cleaner sound with more clarity to give everything more space to breathe. And maybe it says something in and of itself that I still came out of this album generally enjoying it enough where I still think it's pretty decent in spite of following so many personal musical pet peeves of mine. If you do absolutely love it, I definitely get it, but I'm just more of a fan of the sounds and approaches that MED3 explored on their self-titled, or would explore and evolve into on all the albums they put out afterwards, so... On this album, I'm personally just feeling a 6.5 out of 10. But of course, this is just my opinion. You can feel free to disagree with it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts, so leave the comments in the comment thing down there. Shout out to my Patreon supporters, they're awesome people. You want to add yourself that list, link to my Patreon is in the description. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all for today. See you next time.